Ryan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Great to have me. <laughs> Great to be here. Oh my God. Great to I'm have totally... myself in the oh, podcast. All right, no, all right, leave, all right, that right, in, leave that right. in. Leave that in. Leave that. Oh in. Oh my God! Um, it's Monday, man. It's the first day of Q two or Q three. People and it's like Monday. people like authenticity. What kind of coffee well, are you drinking? It's one p.m. Why are you drinking coffee uh, at one p.m.? Because I need it for the aforementioned reason of Monday. But uh, no, I'm. It's from the empanada place down the street in Redwood City. So the, the coffee mm. is shockingly okay. Mm. I'm. But you know, it's like when, when this place advertises itself as a cafe, but then the milk is just a big bucket of the like mini moo packets that you're like, okay, maybe this isn't actually a cafe. Maybe it's, it's more of an empanada place and not an empanada cafe. Mm-hmm. Probably they have great empanadas though. They do. Um, I've got my second one from lunch uh, right here and it's, mm. it's calling to me. G2i is a marketplace for pre-vetted JavaScript developers. Hire React, React Native, and Node.js developers that you can trust on for a contract or full-time basis. G2i will match you with pre-vetted developers within three days of your onboarding call. You'll be able to review their technical profiles and set up interviews with candidates that you like. You get a detailed technical profile that provides the developer's assessment scores in each category, a copy of their code challenge, and a recording of their technical interview. I love G2i, and I use it for all of my companies. I just think it's a great way to get started. It's a really fast way to find a great front-end developer, which is most of what we need these days. React developers are in such high demand, and G2i is the place to find the best React developers. You can test a working relationship with no risk. The first week is free if you decide your developer isn't a good fit. If you don't like it, you won't have to pay for it. G2i's litmus test is simple. Can this developer make an impact in your code base within their first week? Impact is the thing that matters. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash G2i to get started. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash G2i. I really don't have any problem promoting G2i because I have been a power user of their services, and I just got to tell you, it will accelerate your development cadence. You're sitting in an actual office right now. I am. Um, it's It's been fantastic to actually get out of my house for five really? minutes. Yeah. And how many people work at Material Security these days? Uh, 20-something, 20 20- Five, six, I don't how, know. It's, how do they feel about the office? Uh, I mean, we have always been pretty remote friendly. Like early on, we hired a bunch of folks at a Dropbox and like most of the Dropboxers were into piecing out of the Bay Area before before it became mainstream. Uh, and so, and then during COVID, we didn't even like look where people live. So the office is largely kind of like a, if you want to get out of the house and like hang out with people, it's not like a, a place that ever really required doing work. Like we... I think we got to series A without ever having an office and just kind of working out of random people's apartments and Esther's German bakery in Los Altos. So, um, so yeah, office has always been optional. It's, I think when you start the company and you rely on the office, it becomes part of like how you distribute work and like how your governance system and accountability and whatever works. But like when you don't have that, your company from the ground up is, you know, a little more resilient. You don't have to like hunch over the interns and, you know, make them do work and whip them and stuff. You can just, I don't know, talk about it. Is Esther Sherman Bakery and Los Altos particularly good or just particularly? Esther Sherman Bakery is fantastic. Um, One, um, you can just sit in there all day and they have unlimited coffee. We tip them really well because we drink a lot of coffee. Uh, Two, like any place that gets like German pretzels in the Bay Area is sourcing it from Esther's. Uh, And so it's, it's just fantastic. And they have something for every time of day. Um, it's it's unlo- it's I'm in Los Altos. It. Esther Sherman Bakery. No, no, Esther, like a person, a woman's name, uh-huh. Esther. Yeah. Uh, she has a German bakery. Oh, Esther's German, German bakery. Right. Esther German bakery. Yeah, it's been so. At, right. at breakfast, they'll have the biggest, heartiest meal you need as a startup founder. You know, you can get like a gigantic stack of pancakes or, or, or you know, big German waffle things. And okay. it's great. Uh, and then at lunch, you can get a very tasteful little sandwich if you need it. 
And then for dinner, you can celebrate whatever milestone you had as a startup uh, with a, a gigantic, you know, half liter of, of delicious German beer on tap and, um, you know, pretzels and, and have a, a, a beer garden on the back porch. Like is the, the first place I met my series AVC actually was, was, was in that beer garden. So uh, yeah. Trivia yeah. night every Tuesday. They have trivia night. Yep. This is, on, I thought this was, was software podcast, but it's actually just a long, it's an influencer marketing uh, live, for Bakery. live music and sing along second Thursday of every month at 6 30 PM. So after COVID I'm totally down for a live music and sing along. There's a back porch. I think it's pretty COVID friendly. As long as you, you know, keep your distance. Second Thursday of every month. You can do that in Google calendar. I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, so how about this email security? Um, yeah. Most of the security companies I've talked to, I feel like mostly do stuff on the server side and you have some kind of AWS plugin or a GitHub plugin. If you're trying to secure the inbox, is that considerably harder? Do you have to install an agent on my browser to monitor my Gmail? How do you do email security these days? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, security is all over the place. It's it touches, you know, it's applied systems. So there's every kind of security that exists. Like name a kind of you know technology. There's a kind of security industry for it. Uh, when it comes to email, traditionally people think about it as like a firewall. You know, emails are coming in, and you're going to send them to some other you know service that's going to look at the emails and vet them and scan them. You know, before they arrive in your mailbox. Uh, that's, you know, how if I, you know, send you virus.exe to your Gmail from some sketchy thing, like it's not actually going to get delivered, right? Google will block stuff. Uh, and, you know, Microsoft's the same way. There's a whole kind of cottage industry going back like 30 years in email uh, for things like spam blocking, right? And so you can see like, you know, trying to check that link to see if it's something that wants me to type my password in or check that, that, you know, that attachment to see if it's something really tricky. Like it's, it's primarily like a, a bouncer in front of a bar, that security model. Right. And then simultaneously, if I, you know, own a big company and I'm worried about people sending stuff, you know, outgoing an email that they shouldn't, then you'll put something in the wire that also checks emails on, on, on the way out. So email is historically kind of like protected, like the form of network security, right? like networks, you know, it's all by firewalls. Like you can't connect to port 22 because, you know, I said so, right? So it's, or you can, if I like where you're coming from, just kind of gateways, right? Uh, and so that's kind of what led us to making this company because uh, the thing that inspired me a long time ago in, in 2016, when I started working in this space was, uh, you know, the John Podesta hack, which happened on a personal Gmail account. And so the number of times, you know, that, that, that comes up, it's, it's like pretty high and you don't get to control the network on personal accounts, right? Email goes to at gmail.com. Like you actually look at the NS records on gmail.com and it says MX goes to this server and you don't get to change that. So the whole existing email security industry couldn't really do anything because of that, right? So like personal accounts were just not, a thing in the security industry because the whole security industry is used to selling email security to businesses that control their domain, right? So it, it, it obviously like, you know, nowadays people are using Office 365 and, and G Suite or Google Workspace or whatever for their work, but they still control their domain. The first thing you do is you change, you know, DNS to point to, to Gmail, you know, but you could have it point to any of the existing email security vendors and then have them think those things, you know, route it to, to, to Gmail. So, so the, the point is to, we protect email way different than most people do because we, the, the, the kind of problem that brought us into this space was not something that any of the old things could do. And so as a result, the techniques that we invented for protecting personal accounts ended up being really, really, really cool. when We like, brought them into, into corporate environments because they, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Does that kind of make sense? So you can't do the traditional thing. So you have to be creative. And then if you're creative, oh my God, there's a lot of problems with email at work too. The canonical problem that I think about is I somehow get an email with a PDF in it. It makes it through my spam filter and then I download the PDF and it does some malware related stuff. How close to the average email security problem is that? Yeah, I mean... It, it, 
as traditionally conceived by like everybody that buys and sells security software, like that is something, you know, like the fact that, you know, something malicious was in that, that didn't get caught or whatever, whatever is like a gap in your existing solution. And there's someone trying to sell you like a, a newer firewall or something, uh, you know, that will try and scan everything. But the the problem is, is I can send you stuff that will get through any like gateway, right? Like for example, I can send you something uh, at scale to your company that you know has malware, but it's inside a password protected zip file that's actually encrypted, right? And then I could trick you into typing in the password and then detonating it. So the when we talk about email security, like there's just a lot of problems with the traditional like you know someone checking all the emails before they come in because it's always you can always get something through the, the the TSA checkpoint. You can always get something through you know any doorman or firewall or gateway because the point of emails is to send someone an email, you know? So, so we, we care about email, you know, basically all of these problems that, that nobody previously ever really cared about. Like there's, everyone's so focused on like blocking the obvious stuff that like, you know, like the, what happens if I get in your email? Like what happens if I hack some app that you OAuthed and then now I have email access and I didn't, you know, I didn't send you malware, right? I'm in your email. So, so in other words, I could talk at length about the problems that exist, you know, in email, totally independent of like, I can send you tricky files. But like the point is, you know, everybody else in the whole space is like thinking about things like a firewall. And it kind of like blows my mind that people aren't a little more creative when they think about this stuff because we all use it every day. Okay. But email, I think Gmail, I use Gmail in the browser. To me, that is the best, the most, the purest uh, email client these days. I don't really want to use superhuman. I haven't tried it yet. I kind of want to try it, but I just feel like with Gmail, you're closer to the metal, you know, in terms of actual email clients, I like Gmail. I like streak. Um, do you need to get into my Gmail? Like, do you, do you need to have a Gmail plugin or something like no, no, no. Actually- our whole, our whole app is just an API client. Like we, 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 we talk to Gmail, you know, when we're protecting a, a personal account in Gmail or a or a you know a corporate G Suite workspace thing, uh, we just use the regular Gmail API. We're not a client or a plugin or anything like. So no, I mean we sell to companies with like hundreds of thousands of people. Like if we had to install like a client or a plugin, like we'd be we'd be in trouble. <laughs> so it has to work across clients. Like our stuff works with Superhuman. It works with the regular Gmail client. Like we're just we're just an API consumer. I think your, your company is counterintuitive in a lot of ways. And, and that's because I think when people think of email security, again, they really just have this hard uh, variable assignment in their brain where they think email security means scanning for PDFs. And I feel like you're taking it a lot deeper. And I, I really want to just emphasize that. So maybe you could explore, like, can you just give me some like very simple but like shocking facts about email sure. that, that will convince people that email security is like a really, really broad domain. Okay. Yeah. So for example, I don't know if you followed what happened with this Hafnium APT this year. So the Chinese government controls this thing called Hafnium. All right. And they found some zero days uh, in exchange. All right. Uh, they found four of them, in fact, and they used all four of them so that any like exchange server on the internet they could just go and download all the contents up, right? And so what's different about this one versus prior ones is that they didn't just do it to go after like a couple companies and like whatever Tibetan activists that they usually go after. Uh, When they realized that they were like getting found out, they hit like 100,000 different organizations and they downloaded the email of 100,000 different organizations. That's a problem that we care about. For example, you can go on our, our site and our love page and you know, like see people talking about this, this, this Hafnium thing or with the case of SolarWinds, right? Uh, like they actually went and compromised this vendor, SolarWinds, uh, the Russians and, or, you know, depends who you ask, but, you know, obviously. Uh, and so, so then after they did that, they, they did this whole elaborate thing just to hack Microsoft itself and then once they got into Microsoft, then they started raiding people's Office 365 so that they could steal email. So email is two things, right? In security, there's two concepts, right? There's something called a vector, which is how I get you. And there's something called a target, which is what I want, all right? 
And when you talk about email, like a, I'm going to send you some tricky thing that maybe you'll click on, right? We're just talking about email as a vector that maybe I got you to click on something, but then I got your laptop after you clicked on that. And now, now that I've got your laptop, what else am I going to do? And blah, 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 right? But like email is also a target that people actually want to the point that they'll, they'll burn four O days to steal it, right? Or they'll go and compromise like elaborate software suppliers to be able to get it, right? Or, or you know what? Like I, even if I compromise your laptop, the first thing I'm probably going to do in, if, in, inside a corporate environment is open up the email client and download everything that's in there. Because everybody is talking about everything and doing everything and whatever. Like, like you know, I'll, 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 I'll compromise your laptop. I'll open up your email client. I'll see you talking to somebody else about a payment. And then I will slide into that thread and then change the account number and say, oh no, could you send it here instead? And then I'll steal like a million dollars from you on a wire, right? So the, the point is people are trying to get into your email uh, and they're not just trying to send you tricky things, right? They're not just trying to send you malware. If I get into your email, for example, how many things do you sign into with your email where your email is like your username and stuff? Like most things, I assume, right? So well, more specifically my Google account. Yeah, right? but it's, it's still like... There's a bit you know, of a distinction, we, but but it's the same thing pretty much. Right. But it, it, does it have a... What happens when you forget your password on most apps? Yeah. Everything goes through email. Right. So if I get into your email, I spread to everything else and I go oh, yeah. and get everything else too. Oh, yeah. Right. It, it's the single point of failure subject to two-factor authentication, basically. Right. But if which I get is, your laptop, Which is horribly weak. Which is horribly weak. Two-factor authentication is like super well, weak, uh, super defenseless, like, you know can be routed through insecure SMS infrastructure, effectively not secure at all. Well, know. I mean, it depends on the, the, the actual second factor, of course. Like if you're using, you know, WebAuthn or, or YubiKeys or something like, you know, you're in far better shape than if you're using SMS two factor. But, but I think but, there's vectors where if you push on it further, eventually it routes to SMS infrastructure, which is, yeah, but people, which is very People man- fall back on SMS, which, yeah, it blows my mind. Like, I don't know why they do that, but... Um, you know, like a modern MacBook actually has a WebAuthn token built in because Touch ID, and you you can use Face ID now even to as as. A By the way, I, I've I've become a I've become an Apple person because of security. I've just I become an Apple person. That's like, their brand, man. That's what they're going after. I, I finally see it. It's it's pretty amazing. Once you finally see it, once you finally see how important this this feature is, it's just you can't really go with Android. As, as good as Android software is, as bad as Siri is, and as much as I want the Google Assistant, you actually just have to bow down to the gods of security. I I mean I think Android's an ecosystem. So like obviously some like you know LG phone that hasn't seen a patch in two years is not going to be in great shape. But like the the you know, the people that are doing device security on the Pixel phones, like they know what they're doing. Are they as good as Apple? Like, I don't know, but I mean, All what, right. you, what hey, you see with NSO let's get, Group let's recently. Get a little, let's get a little controversial here. Ooh. So Ooh. Um, proposition, iOS is more secure than Android, partly because it is closed source proprietary software. True or false? I mean, well, one, like the whole thing isn't closed source, like Darwin and stuff is open. No evasion, no evasion here. Let's go straight to the heart of the matter. You might as well be saying like Vim versus Emacs here, right? Like as in is open source software more secure or less secure is like, that's a complicated thing. Have you read like Cathedral in the Bazaar? Like, what is it? All all bugs are, what is it? uh, With enough eyeballs, all bugs are tractable or all bugs are simple or something, right? It's true, but that's an eventually consistent system. I, I mean, Apple, to be clear, is a substantially bigger target. There's a reason like NSO Group and stuff prioritizes, uh, you know, iOS malware uh, over anything else. Because like every CEO and every executive is using an iPhone because they're fancier and prettier and nicer. So I think there's, uh, it, what's, what's really funny is you're like, you're asking fundamental questions about, like, as in if you want to say open source versus closed source, what's more secure, like, if that's if that's the specific lightning rod that you're you're asking and, and holding up into a thunderstorm right now. We can discuss that, <laughs> but but in general, the centralization versus decentralization is the is the more interesting thing because a lot of times you see it in security. People are like, well, if I put all my eggs into one basket, it will be easier to secure and monitor the basket and to keep the basket patched and whatever, whatever, right? But then they're like, oh my god, I put all my eggs in one basket, and now you can lose all the eggs at once in the one basket, right? And so. 
there, security is complicated. You know, anybody who's listening that that thinks you know security is easy or is curious about security and doesn't know why all these idiots keep doing. Okay, dumb can things, you stop like, the evasion now? Like, come on, <laughs> man. We need to talk about ransomware eventually, and you're evading right now on the smartphone question. Like I would say empirically, iOS has been more secure than Android because Android is not one thing. It's an ecosystem. Like it's like saying, you know, is Windows more or less secure than iOS? Like anybody can make a Windows machine. Well, like no, we, we, we know the answer to that question. Well, sure. But it's I don't think that there's one answer like and, and, and even the way of saying that, well, this thing is more secure than that thing. And thus you should do this, like make your own choices. Like, you I, know, it's kind of true. The, here's the here's the other thing. The when I think about the the actual bugs in iOS that have appeared over the last call it seven, eight, nine years. Whenever there's a really savage like ownage of the iOS platform, it's just relentlessly savage. It just destroys people so badly. It's like the platform is so generally impenetrable that once it gets penetrated, it just can wreak complete ha- complete havoc. I feel like there have been some 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 security flaws in the iOS platform over the years that have been like really really shocking and, and horrifying. Am, am I am I mistaken? Or it feels like they're like more severe than on Android. I think a lot of this is a function of how they're reported on because like like all the people that you want to hack if you're the bad guys are using iPhones. They're using so, iPhones, right? True. Yeah, and the like casual like, you know, I'm going to have some sketchy app in the App Store that is like you think is a weather app but is actually selling all of your app data, you know, to some black market GDPR non-compliant reseller who's eventually selling it to App Annie or something. Like, you know, that's like th- there's sort of low level suckage is is the nature of the beast in Android. Uh, whereas, yeah, iOS, like, yep, it turns out that the Saudis bought a thing from the Israelis that let them go and read the iPhone of all the people that they want to hit with the bone saw or whatever. Like it yeah. tends to be a little more dramatic and targeted in iOS yeah. land. I- I'm with you there. For anyone who's into tech or who uses tech, and that's most of us, season two of the new reality series by Arm Podcast is here, and it'll be exploring what the not-so-distant future of consumer technology will look like. It's hosted by the technologist and neuroscientist Poppy Crum. It's created by Arm, the leading provider of processor technology for mobile devices. This series looks five to ten years into the future to see how digital and mobile technologies will further empower our lives. The podcast series covers the relationship with technology and the potential for tomorrow, a look into the future of mobile experiences, what the development roadmap looks like to get there, the tech of today that can help us bring life to tomorrow's innovations. In the first episode, we meet Davis Fatal, co-founder and CEO of 3D Lightfield tablet manufacturer Leia, to talk about immersive engagement through mobile screen-based devices. Check out the new reality series by Arm Podcasts on Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Act in time with Influx Data. Observability into stacks, sensors, and systems with InfluxDB, the open-source time series database to instrument, observe, learn, and automate any system, application, and business process. InfluxDB gives you high granularity, high scale, and high availability. Capture, analyze, and store millions of points per second to see across all your data sources. With InfluxDB Cloud, you can now get the full power of InfluxDB without the need to provision infrastructure and manage clusters. It's a fast, elastic, serverless, real-time monitoring platform, dashboarding engine, analytics service, and event and metrics processor. You can start collecting metrics in minutes by using one of the 11 client libraries, the popular Telegraph plugin, or one of the pre-configured InfluxDB templates. To learn more and get started for free, visit influxdata.com slash sedaily. That's influxdata.com slash sedaily. Dude, um, <clears throat> whenever I take a moment to look at the soft underbelly of the internet as as viewed by security f- vulnerabilities, it just makes me really sick. Like, I just get a little bit nauseous. Like, see, whenever I look at ransomware stuff, 
Whenever I look into ransomware, I just get a little bit sick. Or crypto jacking, all this, it, it just creeps me out, man. Modern security is so creepy. Dude, don't you feel I, that I, way? Don't you ever feel that I, way? You're just like, holy crap, I, this stuff is kind of dangerous. In my mind, there's this race, okay? There's a race. And it's going basically between what are the new things that technology can do for me versus like, what is that exposing me to? Because security is a, it's a time delta, right? It's a, well, you invented this thing and then, oh my God, the unintended consequences of the invention of this thing, right? And, and the nature of technology, when you zoom out, I know you're a, an enthusiast and, and philosopher on the nature of this stuff. It's computers are always doing more for you than they were doing last week. All right. So it's an expanding, you know, it's, it's a balloon or it's an expanding circle. It's, it's like ripples in a pond as technology does more and more and more. And then the reason, you know, security is a huge pain in the ass is because it's trying to play catch up with something that has an expanding surface area, right? If all, if, if the only computer I used was an ATM to get cash, which I then, you know, walked over to the farmer's market or something. And that, you know, and we're, we're talking about like the eighties where that was like the only computer the average person used, uh, then like, you just that you only have to protect one thing, but like seriously, your whole damn life is accessible in your phone now, and so it's doing more for you. That means like people like me are the cleanup crew for the rest of the technology industry, for the, the rest of, of you know society as it becomes more and more computerized. So like the reason it's scary for you is because of how much of your life is now tied up in this stuff, right? It, well, and this is um. I almost don't even want to talk about this stuff on the air. It just makes me sick to think about. I, I, I let's let's change the subject. I honestly, I can't talk about. I seriously, I just don't even want to talk about this stuff. It's just like it's too too. It's it's a little bit too creepy for me to even talk about on air. It's like too black mirrorish because I think about it. And I, do you know what I'm talking about here? Like I, I do you know like the kind of things that I kind of don't want to talk about that just make me sick. Like you know when you're in a position where you can imagine things in security and they really really creep you out. It's not just security, man. It's like the unintended consequences of how much technological change has happened in the last 20 years, we are going to be feeling for, you know, a lot longer than 20 years. So like tech, like one of my, one of my favorite sayings is technology spreads because it's useful, not because it's safe. All right. So like it will, it will cover the entire human experience. It will cover the whole globe, right? You will use it a hundred times a day before the implications and the unintended consequences of that are anywhere apparent. And security so, is just one of many things so, that should make you very disquieted. So I, started, I know for a technology person, I'm kind of a Luddite, but it's really so important. I, I started I started building a few companies recently, a, a few other companies other than Software Daily. Because um, with Software Daily, we have a really good CEO in place. So I've been moving on starting these other companies. And um, I, started, I started a payments company and a, a gaming company. We've raised money for both of them. And one of the... Um, uh, employment exercises that is true at all of my companies is you have to learn to play poker. So basically all of all employees at, at, at each company that I work at, that I'm, that I'm a shareholder in need to learn to play poker. And the reason for that is you need to know how deeply exploitative other people can be. Like you just need to know that in today's world with all the attack vectors that we have, you just need to know, like you need to understand depravity at scale is is my perspective. For, you know, if, if you want to Joseph Conrad approach to to being a software CEO, it kind it, it kind of is. It kind of is. Mm -hmm. You know, I I just feel like that's the world where we're he where we're headed. It's just it's it's a little bleak to be honest. I don't know. Do you feel the same way or do you feel optimistic? I I, I mean I this obviously you know gets pretty obscure, but I'm. I read as much history as I do sci-fi and like, there's a lot about the human condition. That's like pretty damn bleak, you know, in, in prior years. Uh, and so there's, you know, I don't, I would say that, you know, the classic like Orwellian consequences of, of the technology that we have now, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously there, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, th there's, there's a lot to like about the future. Um, it's going to take like smart people, you know, doing their best to like believe in, in the values of individual freedom and privacy and stuff like that. Like it's, it's, it's a fight that will never be won, but I think it won't be lost either.
right? So it's I, there's no reason that the future has to be Orwellian or bleak. And there's a lot to like about how cheap communication is and how how accessible information is, right? Like there's a lot, you know, a lot of ignorance in like you know the world of 100 years ago that would be like completely like like mysterious and and like impossible nowadays, right? Like people died for the lack of knowledge about basic things, right? So I, I don't know. I, I think that the world is definitely getting better. I mean, it's a kind of like, are you a, you know, Steven Pinker, like better angels kind of person or not? I, I, I think I am, but it, it means that you're always going to have to keep it together and you're always going to have to be fighting for, for whatever values you believe in. Um, and, and my personal ones are obviously like liberal democracy and individual freedom and things like that. Right. But and privacy is quite important and it, it, it constantly needs to be needs to be, you know, relitigated um, and, you know, rearticulated in every generation. So I don't think technology makes the world into shit. I think it makes the world different and good people have to fix the world constantly. Every generation needs to fix the world because of something technology did to it. You know, imagine two generations ago when we were fighting over atom bombs, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, oh my God, my iPhone can get hacked and that would be so bad for my life. Yes. But like, we now had the ability to nuke the entire planet and turn it into glass. You know, like technology giveth and technology taketh away and every generation has its fight. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to do my part in this generation's fight, but I'm not hopeless. I'm never hopeless. All right. I want to present you the fork in the road. We can go more obscure or we can like randomly move into talking about engineering management and email security company. W- whatever you want, man. It's your okay. Show. Let's, let's Literally. go obscure. Let's go obscure. Um, proposition. We're already in the metaverse. Zoom is cr- critical to the metaverse. Clubhouse like experiences are critical to the metaverse. Shared group messaging is critical to the metaverse. M- metaverse. Uh, group VoIP calls are critical to the metaverse. AirPods are critical to the metaverse. Low cost Bluetooth headsets are critical to the metaverse. Do you agree that we are in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously it depends on exactly, I think you're, you're bringing this up because like Zuck used the term metaverse a bunch recently to describe his ambitions or something. I largely avoided that because it looked confusing, but like, I always think about like, you know, there's a, I think I read a lot of like postmodernism at a very like vulnerable time in my life when I was a teenager. And I, I kind of think about like the, you know, like, like even this interaction we're having right now on zoom, like, yes, it's remote, whatever, but like, it's, it's piggybacking on all of this, like, machinery that we have psychologically based on like, you know, when our ancestors met in the forest and needed to determine like friend or foe or something, it's this very natural thing, but it's also very artificial at the same time. Right. It it is, it is a, it is keeping the legitimacy of a face-to-face meeting between human beings. And instead it's, it's abstracting it. And each of us could have, you know, weird zoom filters on. You wouldn't even know what I look like or who I am. Right. Like we're assuming that the image on the screen is truthful and that this is my actual voice and all this stuff. So I, I don't know, like all this stuff became abstracted a long time ago, you know, when people started doing fantastic, you know, works of, of art, you know, in a way that's like, you know, distributed across thousands of people online, you know, when, when you realized like the, the power of like, you know, wikis and Wikipedia, like, I, I think the internet w- w- was a metaverse and it's just been growing and growing and growing to the point that like real life and physical life, I think mean, COVID is sort of where it jumps the shark, right? And you're like, my life is in the computer. But every once in a while, I meet these these weird meat sacks in person. But I might get sick from breathing their air, like you know. So I, I think it's 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 been sneaking up on us. Most things involving technology tend to sneak up on you, you know. <laughs> so I, I think the metaverse is is coming up on thirty years old, personally. But I think it started with like the printing press, and it's just been getting weirder since then. Can I tell you something that depresses me in infrastructure these days? Sure. Everybody has taken their eye off the most important ball. The most important ball is zero cost transactions, micropayments. And the only people that are working on that are like the the layer two cryptocurrency people. And they all seem politically wrapped around the axle. So they're not actually going to get this thing done. Like Lightning Network has been around for what, three, four years. And yet we still have expensive payment systems like all of this stuff is moving at such a slow pace. And in the meantime, we have the best companies in the world that have high margin cash cows 
And basically all they're focused on is like moderation and metaverse BS and like virtual reality, this and mobile that and ad tech, this, and, you know, search engine stuff that and it's like, what, what are you guys doing? Like, where's my zero cost micropayment system? Why can't I send five cents to a Nigerian knowledge worker? Like, why can't I do that yet? Why can I send an email to anybody? I can send a Slack message to lots of friends and I can't send 12 cents or like, you know, three Satoshis to somebody. What's going on? Why can't anybody build this stupid thing? It's, it's really aggravating to me. Do you, do you ever get yeah. aggravated about stuff like that? Like stuff that you don't really feel like you have a control over? I, I definitely had to do some thinking on like the real, I'm not a big cryptocurrency person. I'm more of like a, you know, social commentary, like thinking about systems as I don't have a dog in, in the crypto race or anything, but like, I think what it exposes is just how like political the monetary system truly is. It's a, it's a tool of social policy. It's a tool of, you know, foreign relations. So like, you know, all these governments actually at the end of the day, kind of like their currencies, you know, and like, just because you want to have like a, a decentralized PayPal, you know, or some, some Patreon with no minimums. And like I, the idea of like money is just information. And if information is basically free, why isn't money free? Uh, well, it turns out there are some key differences between money and information. And like, it took, it took rock bottom. It took Facebook being like, well, we could do this. And then every government in the world being like, oh no, you don't. Right. Because like there are, there are political forces in the world that undergird and supplement and occasionally are, are in you know, direct competition with the technological and, and economic forces in the world. And it turns out money is politics too. So the reason that none of the top tier companies are, are fighting for this you know, zero cost five cent payments to Nigeria or whatever is because the ones that do get smacked down by governments. You know, Facebook tried. And it got smacked down because who wants the only thing worse than, than publicly administered money is privately administered money. No, you're missing the point. Okay. So face you're, you're, you're kind of dissing Facebook Libra there, right? Like you're basically saying that like the only thing worse than government administered money is privately corporately administered money, right? That was what you said. Sure. So Facebook Libra, first of all, I'm not going to dispute you that it's probably not the best um, semi-decentralized payment system, but it's a semi-decentralized payment system. That's what it is. It's not a it's not a private um, payment system. I mean, sure, sure. There's no <laughs> single point of truth. Whatever. It's a like, but yeah, the point well, is, it's well, still a network, and the network so, still has influence. You so know, it was like, it it was okay. So so Libra. Libra was hilarious for many reasons. Um, and, and it was obvious. The sad thing about Libra, what really made me sad, especially as somebody who like is a huge fan of Facebook. I mean, I literally spent two and a half years writing a book about the company. Um, it's a referendum on how people see Facebook. If you look at this, if you look at this case study, it's basically a referendum on how how poorly Facebook is regarded by the general business community. Because what, what happened is they did this consortium thing. Do you remember this? Like they did this like consortium of- With like Visa and all these other companies. It was yeah. like Visa on, it's like, the mo, it's like the most random coterie of high profile companies. It's like very random, very random co coterie. It was uh, Andreessen Horowitz who, your portfolio, you're Andreessen Horowitz portfolio company, yep. right? Okay, so it's like Andre, Andreessen Horowitz, um, Stripe, PayPal, Visa, like whatever. It's like the cabal, right? It's It was a cabal, clearly. Like Goldman Sachs or something. Just like cabal of people who are going to oversee the financial system. Actually, it's a great idea. That's But it's like, it's the, the messaging is so like blatantly like, hey, we're Facebook. We're just, we're just allocating power. Like what, what do you... You guys have a problem with this? Like, what's what's the big deal? And then it's like, like the, obviously, the, obviously, like the messaging is just like seriously, like, and so everybody just immediately is like, okay, this is the stupidest thing ever. Why would we put the monetary system in control of the of the Facebook ordained cabal of financial arbitration? Like, what? We're doing that, and then so Stripe pulled out, right? Didn't Stripe pull out within weeks? 
of this announcement yeah, and it was it like was a rush to the exits pretty fast yeah. it was like okay so the the best company in the world pulls out of the facebook ordained financial system like like or was was that just like stripes like straight up dagger well, into no. facebook or so, i mean what the, what the cryptocurrency people don't seem to understand uh i think i had this like you know it, it like dawned on me one day that like all the things you know as a software engineer about like open source project governance and like all the soft power of who decides like what, you know, the community, but what forks get merged and is it, is it Linus and, and Guido Van Rossum versus the open source, whatever, whatever, like everything you know about the politics of, of an open source project globally and, and how it's used and how it's developed and what the roadmap is like, like the, the underlying cryptocurrencies themselves might be decentralized right? It's not like one bank controls the master ledger of anything, but there's still a, tr- like w- what they do is it, it takes everything about open source project governance and it kind of treats it like the federal reserve, right? So like, there's a ton of soft power in being like, you know, the, the, you know, Linus Torvalds of, of, you know, Ethereum, right? Obviously like the Vitalik guy or whatever does that, but like, my point is a it's Vitalik just because something, guy? I don't, I'm not a cryptocurrency person. Vitalik Buterin? I don't know these people. I just the Vitalik the guy. <laughs> I didn't claim to be an expert. You brought up this topic. But my point is, uh, like, just because something is decentralized does not mean you, you want whoever controls it to control it. And like, you know, and, and, and that, in that case, Facebook is literally the financial, you know, the Federal Reserve of, of you know, Libra or whatever. And, and, and I, I like the Federal Reserve because it's, you know, created by Congress and which is, you know, a representative you know, thing that I can influence and vote for and stuff. So like my, my monetary system, I like wrapped up with my political system, you know, and just because something's on the internet and just because something doesn't literally have a, a oh, master okay. ledger no, no, no. does on, not hold, mean hold it's on. free or, or hold just. On, hold on. <laughs> okay. You don't want one financial system, man. Like you want a multitude of financial systems. Like this whole, dude, how many operating I'm an American. Systems? I like one. <laughs> how many operating systems do you have in your life? Uh, I mean, a couple, but besides having the word system in them, why is that relevant? Is no, that- no, how, how many? No, no, bear with me. How many operating systems do you have in your life? Uh, I mean, so there's Android, or Linux. I mean, so there's Linux, uh, you know, Darwin, BSD, whatever, and like, uh, you know, the whatever Windows, like 64 bit kernel. So it depends how, many, how you draw an operating system. But how many, how many different Linux distributions are involved in your life? <sighs> uh, I mean, everything runs Linux is in how, m- how many, you know, Amazon devices do I own that are currently running some random Linux kernel? So yes, okay. dozens. And what is the cardinality of random Linux kernels that are running those various systems? As in, they're probably all on different kernels. They, you know, like they're like, is in kernel versions? Like how many Linux kernel? Hey, versions well, I would actually, I would actually take the, take the like unique, the unique product fingerprint of, um, operating system cross hardware that it's running on. So uh, that's that would be my like unique fingerprint. Anyway, where I'm driving with this is you have a multitude of operating systems and then hardware sets and firmware sets and whatever sets that you run on in your life. So like the same is going to happen with payments, right? You're going to have a multitude of payment systems, right? That's this company that we're starting called Rectangle. It's basically Linux for payments. Um, by the way, the round is not closed yet. We're still trying to wrap up this round. It's ridiculous how long this is taking, but we're doing Linux for payments because you want like a different embedded payment systems, right? You want a multitude of embedded payment systems. As in, um, do you mean the actual like underlying currency ledger or do you mean like, you know, like so last you basically mile client need, software you, or what? You basically need a Zapier. You need open source Zapier for money. So take the simple use case, I swipe a credit card or no, more realistically, more realistically, I'm a merchant. I want to accept fiat. My customer has crypto. Okay. So like you come to my open source, decentralized Shopify clone where I sell hats. I'm a normal guy, right? I just sell normal hats. They just say software engineering daily on them. You're a crazy, weird security enthusiast who likes crypto. You only have crypto. You need to pay with crypto. I want to accept fiat. The middleware there is a rectangle, a rectangle kite. It's like a, it's like a, basically like a Zapier zap kind of thing. We have kites. So like the conversion module, we produce conversion modules. They're open source. We host them, but they're open source. We also tell you how to host them, but basically there's all these Zapier zaps for money. 
or conversion modules, that's what we do. And then who takes the actual financial transaction risk of converting the currencies? And we do, you know, we do. Okay. And we price that in so that, so like we're not cheap, right? Like we're, we're kind of terrible. We're kind of like a terrible, expensive service. We're like Stripe, <laughs> but more expensive, basically. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one. Uh, cool. Yeah. I mean, we're, 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 the, we're like, we're like square, but we're a rectangle. I got it. Like a slightly more, less constrained square, rhombus even. Quad, some form of quadrilateral, uh, you know, parallelograms and trapezoids are also involved. So we're the founding member of the uh, of the quadrangle consortium, which is a division of the shapes consortium. <laughs> is this becoming like a object oriented programming lesson at some point? No, it's more like a shapes oriented proclamation. I see. Um, I'm down. Yeah. So. I, I don't know. It's just, I, I'm an American and I like dollars because dollars are how the U.S. projects power. So, Are you building cloud applications with a distributed team? Check out Teleport, an open source identity aware access proxy for cloud resources. Teleport provides secure access to anything running somewhere behind NAT. SSH servers, Kubernetes clusters, internal web apps, and databases, Teleport gives engineers superpowers. Get access to everything via single sign-on with multi-factor. List and see all SSH servers, Kubernetes clusters, or databases available to you. Get instant access to them, all using the tools you already have. Teleport ensures best security practices like role-based access, preventing data exfiltration, providing visibility, and ensuring compliance. Best of all, Teleport doesn't get in the way. Download Teleport at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash teleport. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash teleport. Today's episode of Software Engineering Daily is sponsored by Prophecy.io a complete, low-code data engineering platform for the enterprise. Prophecy enables all your teams on Apache Spark with a unique, low-code designer. While you visually build your data flows, Prophecy generates high-quality Spark code on Git. Then you can schedule these with Prophecy's low-code airflow. Not just that, Prophecy provides end-to-end visibility into your data flows with metadata search and column-level lineage. Prophecy makes enterprise data teams productive with new workflows, but what about existing workflows that are stuck in old proprietary ETL formats? For that, Prophecy has a transpiler that automatically converts ab initio, Informatica, SSIS, and Alteryx workflows to high-quality Spark code. See how Prophecy can modernize your data engineering with a free account at prophecy.io slash sedaily. I get it, but that this is my point though. You want domain specific payment systems, right? Sure. Yeah. Just uh, it's I like do you do you use do you send do you use do you use gRPC for everything? Like I use WebRTC sometimes, I use gRPC sometimes. I, I, last time I, I checked gRPC doesn't work in browsers, so uh that's well, why you I don't can, use it. You can do like protobufs over browsers, right? Like you can send a protobuff. You can send me an Ajax request with a protobuf in it, but gRPC itself doesn't work. Like you can't you can't write a native gRPC client uh, on on the other end of an Ajax request. But theoretically, like, something like that should work, right? You should be able to do gRPC over a WebSocket or something, right? gRPC is like it's actually not. As in, you're using the term, I think, a little bit a little bit differently. Is you can send protocol buffers and you can make protocol buffers you know, for function interfaces, right? Uh, but gRPC is like a specific like wire level protocol that supports like streaming and blah, 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 blah. Like you can, if I have sockets, I can do whatever I want, but like, yeah, you'd have to, then you, I think you'd have to build it directly on top of a web socket and then you'd have to write like, you know, gRPC server on the server side, whatever. But like gRPC itself, like should be able to do it, but it, it, it I think there was that's like- my, I mean, that's my point. Like if you want, if you want to know like, like next generation- um, like agro data transfer over a WebSocket type interactions, you do you want to do gRPC over WebSockets? I'm pretty sure, or something like that. Yeah, I mean it's just a or matter of or like or the layers being clean. 
how do you use um, WebRTC? How do you use WebRTC for uh, like like high fidelity communications protocols? Can you do that? Yeah, I mean that's what it's designed for. RTC stands for like real time communications. Yeah, but, but, it, but right now it's only used for vi- for like video, right? Everybody. No, you can. Stream- no, 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 no. So I've actually done a bunch of RTC before. Not as much as my friend Faras, but like. Uh, Wait, what's that guy up to these days? I love that uh, guy. He's I'm still such doing. A huge he's fan still doing guy. file sharing, man. Go and go and oh, check out his thing. God. He's got this like I'm wormhole. A, thing. I'm a Fer- Ferris uh, Abuka Dejian <laughs> fanboy. Um, he's uh, he's one of these people who is like a, like inspiring as a developer, like Dan Abramov or um. Yeah, do you follow Dan Dan Abramov? Uh, just I bow at the temple of Faras. Just just Faras okay. is the only All god. Right. Forget it. All right, that's fine. Anyway, sorry, right, but continue, my point is continue. you get it. You get a data channel when you do a web a web RTC negotiation. Like you get a channel that you can send bits along, so you don't have to use it for voice and video. Like I I wrote like a a long time ago. I made like a peer to peer like coder pad, like shared you know collaborative text editor uh, that didn't have like a, a back end that was just peer to peer. And I I sent all of the like you know cursor positions and like you know what what keys you were typing and stuff you know across the webrtc channel so you can do peer to peer data over it for us actually did a company a long time ago that was like doing a cdn yeah over he sold the yahoo yeah yeah he so, sold the yahoo that guy that man, guy they were loading so they were loading images over it so that guy is so precocious i i precocious I, I, implies I, you're young and we're all old now so he used to be young and i used I to be young i think of him as we're it, all old wait are you are you his age no he's he's 2 years younger than me i think that's Maybe right three. yeah yeah. Well, I always felt like he was precocious because I, I followed him on Quora because I think he worked at Quora for a little <laughs> bit. Anyway, um, how's go to market? Uh, I mean, we sell a lot of software these days. It's pretty cool. I like, believe you. I, it's it's like it's weird having a company that actually dude the uh, margins the margins and security are so good. Uh, I, I bet you're SaaS margins. The margins I mean, in SaaS are good, but it's it's cheap to run SaaS, right? Like your 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 runtime. No. <laughs> it's not. Am I wrong? We process like billions and billions of emails. Like, oh, you know, sorry, there's okay, a lot I'm of stupid. What's your no, what's I your mean, what's your biggest cost center in infrastructure? Is it like uh, uh, is it Databricks clusters or something? Uh, I probably can't go like too specifically on how our infrastructure ooh, works, ooh, but uh, ooh, but suffice it to say, lots ooh. of big data and scanning and processing lots and lots of emails. Big so, data scanning yeah. processing lots of emails. Hmm. I mean, um, what we do is we walk backwards throughout the history of a mailbox because we're trying to like protect the data inside of it, for example, and so it's not just about like getting turned on and like watching all like new email come in looking for spam or malware. Like, no, no, no. That's like, that's just part of it. You have to be able to analyze like 20 years of email. Right. So uh, it's a pretty heavy lift infrastructurally to do it. So you have to, you have to do it as fast as you can. <laughs> um, can you tell me any opinions that you have on data infrastructure? Give me, uh, give me, Okay, so here's here's what I, I have lots of can opinions I, on data infrastructure. So here's, can I tell you my my favorite thing about the um, the Andreessen Horowitz um, infrastructure investment strategy is the uh, the whole portfolio synergy around data infrastructure, where they have like basically the smartest data infrastructure people around them. You know what I mean? Like they have DBT, they have Databricks, they have AnyScale, they have um, what else? Like high t- or uh, um, Census. Like, and then, and then, so I imagine if you're doing email security data infrastructure, you can sort of go to the smartest minds in streaming basically, and, and really know how to run streaming infrastructure. Am am I wrong? Well, so I'm, I'm like, you know, old enough at this point that I've seen like a couple waves of like data infrastructure and stuff. And so I, I came of age, you know, in the Valley in like 2009, 2010, 2011, when like, you know, the first wave of like Hadoop and, and, you know, like Kafka hadn't been invented yet and all these things. And so uh, it's weird for me seeing all of it cycle again. Cause like basically that wave, you know, it had, it had IPOs, it was great, whatever, but then it, it basically died. And for a couple of years, you couldn't do anything involving analytics in the Valley. And like, it, it took like kind of reviving big data as like, data science, AI, ML, something, something, something. And it took a bunch of exits, like, like, you know, Looker selling to Google and, and, you know, Confluent doing really, really well. Like it it took a lot of stuff to get VCs to be interested in, in general data infrastructure again. So I'm, I'm kind of old school enough that I have like my own opinions on like how data should be processed and whatever, 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 but it's, 
Andreessen has done a good job of, of, you know, being well invested in this wave of stuff. And there's some great companies in there. And, and obviously like, I'm a huge fan of Databricks and broadly in general, but I remember when people are like this spark thing, this is a paper, it's got no future or something, something, something. And, and I think the way that what's really interesting for me is how like the rise of, of like public cloud by default and not just public infrastructure, public cloud infrastructure, but the managed services on top of it, like, you know, it used to be like Amazon had Elastic MapReduce and, or you could like, you know, spin up, you know, some Redshift cluster or something. And that was it, you know, whereas nowadays the things that, are, that come built into the public cloud services are so good that it's been interesting for me watching like the big data ecosystem in this generation be up a couple levels in the stack or to be really, really focused on certain domains. So just the, the, the elaborate dance around the trillion dollar cloud platforms has just been kind of interesting. And, and that's the, the most, you know, creative thing I think I see in the ecosystem is how do you make money when you're not Google, Microsoft, or Amazon? So, well, I mean, on the other hand, you know, you don't have the baggage of being attached to a giant organization. Yeah, but they own the actual, like I said, I'm not sure if I should tell this story, but I was talking to someone high up at Amazon uh, and, and I remember doing diligence on like Snowflake's A or B for somebody back in the day. And I was like, Amazon's early to this party with Redshift. Like, there's no way that like they're going to screw this up. Yeah, Redshift is just par Excel. And so, it, it, you know, it's not going to scale. They're going to need to like redo it. But the idea of having like large scale SQL analytics built into your cloud platform, like was something they clearly understood. Right. And then Snowflake comes out and they're basically just selling Dremel you know, on top of AWS, right? They're, they're selling BigQuery on AWS and BigQuery on Azure. At the end of the You're day, that's how it works. You're kidding me. Snowflake's based on the Dremel paper? I mean, they, as in partially, like they're, they're like ex-Oracle people too, but like the, the point is like, it is a horizontally scalable, large scale SQL analytics warehouse, you know? Uh, well, not so, just horiz- horizontally scalable, it's also vertically scalable because it does like the, the, like the storage tiering thing. Yeah, as in like Dremel is like really tightly coupled to like a bunch of Google specific abstractions. But like my, my point is everyone else in the whole world was largely doing like Hey, didn't like, do wasn't Dremio? Dremio did the Dremel paper also, right? No, 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 no. Dremi was Tomer's company, right? Yes, uh, Dremio is Tomer's company. But Apache he was drill. doing Apache Drill. Yeah. Apache Drill. That's not Dremel. Yeah, sorry. I remember. Sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. That's but drill. it was it was That's inspired drill. by it. As in there were That's a lot true. of Dremel clones, like yeah. Clara made Impala. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh you know, right, right, right. Hortonworks right. tried to get there with <clears throat> by like turning was it project right. but something snowflake, or whatever snowflake was like a fresh approach plus experience building oracle that's like a magical recipe and right they there. didn't attempt to screw with the hoodie ecosystem they just said look you've got aws and you want a really good data so, warehouse okay can but we just- the, the, the whole reason i brought up this story though like i want to get to the punchline it's like when I asked the people at AWS about this, I'm like, how does Snowflake, you know, like, how is it so valuable? Like, why didn't you guys just have a viable, like, BigQuery in AWS? And like, cause they, they spent a bunch of time, like, messing with Presto and Athena and stuff like that. It sucks. Like, I used to run Presto at Dropbox. Like, I'm sorry, it kind of sucks. Uh, and like, they said, well, you understand, even if, like, you know, Snowflake doesn't have any servers. Like they, we get paid when people buy Snowflake, right? If Snowflake sells a bunch of stuff, like we get paid either way. So what Google, Amazon, and Microsoft have is the actual physical machines on which the, all this stuff is is hosted. Oh yeah. oh yeah. So like the point is they they get paid whether they, you know, can capture the margins of running the service, but even if they can't, they still own the roads that you're driving on. So like they're getting paid either way. And so I think the data infrastructure companies, you have to really innovate way high up in the stack because it's like, it's like being a fabulous, you know, semiconductor company. Like you, you can't actually control your destiny because you, you serve at the pleasure of one of the public clouds. So, man, I'd love to keep talking to you. We don't have much time. Um, Do you live in the Bay Area? You want to grab dinner sometime? I do. I live in Redwood City. You can. Can I come to Redwood City and we can have dinner sometime? It's the, the the on the sign by Caltrain. It says "Climate Best by Government Test." So I don't know when that happened. Wow, but it is a beautiful place to have dinner. So. Okay, awesome. Thanks for coming on, man. This is great. This is a ton of fun.